Back when I started watching HBO's Game of Thrones in 2016, the element of the show that I enjoyed the most by a pretty wide margin were the characters. They all felt so real and had such depth and were so well-written as compared to other fantasy characters I'd encountered before. And it was the real driving force that kept me watching the show, given the fact that all of these characters had very deep internal conflicts that kept them going and altered the way they interacted with the world around them, which I think is a massive part of both the show and Martin's world-building. When I went to read the books a few months later, I was surprised to find hundreds of characters that I had no idea existed, given the fact that they were all excluded from Game of Thrones. I don't blame David and Dan for excluding all of these. I think Renifer Longwaters and other characters who might be very minor roles uh, could be excluded fairly easily. However, today I'm going to be discussing a number of characters who I think are fantastic uh, characters and should have been included in HBO's Game of Thrones. I'll be discussing seven individuals today, unless I decide to add more while making this video, which there is a very decent chance I will. Additionally, to stipulate my kind of uh, rules here for including a character, I'm not going to include any characters who do appear in the show in any capacity, even if they're heavily altered. For example, Wyman Manderly shows up in like season seven and eight, I think it might just be seven. Uh, but regardless, he's very changed from his book counterpart, but I won't count him because he is technically in the show. That could be another video in the future, should this one do well. Additionally, I'm going to avoid including point of view characters. I think they're all pretty well known, and I think that they're uh, just so essential to the story going forward, at least in most cases. Sorry, Aerie Sokart. Uh, that I think that they could be their own video as well. This video is going to be focused on other characters who aren't viewpoints, but are still excellent examples of Martin's world building and character development in minor roles. For my first example, I have a two for one, that being the Super Tyrell brothers. In the show, it's just Loris Tyrell and Marjorie Tyrell. Those are the siblings. They are the kind of continuous of this house, and when they're exploded in the sept, that's it. That's the end of it. However, in the books, they have two siblings, both of whom I really like in their roles there. First and foremost, Willis Tyrell. Willis is the eldest son of Lord Mace, the secret genius, and he is the heir to Highgarden. We actually haven't seen him in the main series, but we've heard a great deal about him. He's a fairly nice man, it seems, and he was actually uh, hurt and his injury lingers when he was in his youth. His father pressured him to participate in uh, essentially a tourney too early, and this resulted in Oberyn Martell, the Red Viper of Dorne, knocking him off of his horse and causing his leg to be permanently injured. Uh, because of this, he still uses a cane, but he's taken up hawking and a number of other scholarly pursuits, and he seems to be turning into kind of an ideal lord for the Reach. He is someone who is often proposed for marriage. Initially, he is the candidate who Sansa is going to marry in A Storm of Swords rather than Loras in the show, and later in A Dance of Dragons, Kevin Lannister thinks that uh, Mace is going to try to marry Willis to Cersei, which, God, I hope for Willis's sake, that doesn't happen. Willis also has a younger brother, Garlin. He's the second born of Mace Tyrell's sons, and he's called Garlin the Gallant. It is a very appropriate name for him, as he is a very great knight. However, the backstory of this name is kind of sweet. He was a bit uh, on the heavier side as a boy, and Willis uh, wanted to prevent him from getting some bad nickname, as they have an uncle called Garth the Gross. So he started calling his brother Garlin, Garlin the Gallant, in order to help uh, kind of create this sense of honor around him. And it seems to have worked. He's kind of grown into this very great example of a knight. We meet him throughout A Storm of Swords, and he does seem like a really nice guy. He's nice to Sansa, which is very much not true of many other characters in King's Landing, and he's one of the few characters to talk back to King Joffrey, saying that was ill done in reference to something that the kind of psychopathic king was doing. Overall, both of these brothers, while not essential to the story so far, uh, they are great additions to the world as a whole and add to the Tyrells as a family, given the fact that they won't likely all be wiped out in a single stroke by Cersei in the books, and it seems like some degree of their family will persevere, as they are fairly uh, far, far apart at this point. Both of these brothers are located in the Reach as of A Dance with Dragons. We might see them in the Winds of Winter, but we also might not. They're pretty far away. And hey, if you enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it, it really helps grow the channel, and any support is just very nice to see. Uh, without further ado, let's get back to some more cut characters. Next up is another great one, that being Strong Belwas. Strong Belwas is a member of Daenerys' camp, and I think in the show, Daenerys' whole party suffers from the fact that it does feel smaller than it does in the books. They cut a lot of the marine plot, and even some of Daenerys' story before then, and in doing so, it makes her plot just feel more kind of niche, and the same characters keep playing the same roles, and it feels repetitive almost at a point. Having characters like Strong Belwas do very much add to this uh, kind of sense of grandiosity to her story. Who is Strong Belwas? 
loss, however. He is an individual sent to Daenerys by Illyrio Mopatis, so the initial person who married her off to the Dothraki. He was a former pit fighter, and he was one of the most gifted fighters in all of Essos. He has this policy where any time he fights someone, he allows his enemy to cut him once before he uh, kills them. He's just a really interesting guy, and we introduce uh, ourselves to him via Daenerys' perspective in A Clash of Kings and A Storm of Swords, where we see that Barristan Selmy is acting kind of as his squire. So he is kind of undercover at that point, but hey, if Barristan Selmy is acting as your squire, I think you're kind of a cool guy. That scene in the show where Dario wins the Siege of Marine in single combat, in the books, that's strong Belwas. As we get into Marine and Daenerys begins to come into her own as a leader, Belwas kind of guides her and acts as kind of a backbone to her rule, serving as a militaristic force if need be, as he's a very capable fighter. However, it is in one of Daenerys' later chapters that we see something kind of harmful befall strong Belwas, if I could speak. He eats a bunch of locusts at the pit where Daenerys flies off with Drogon, and afterwards he ends up getting very, very sick. It's unclear whether or not these locusts were poisoned. In early drafts by Martin, they weren't, though there is some indication via Barristan's perspective that they were poisoned, but then again, Barristan might be manipulated by the shape pate. Regardless, uh, Belwas ends up getting sick for much of the latter half of A Dance with Dragons and ends up a bit more withered and a bit less strong than he was, but he is still strong Belwas. I think that he probably poisoned them himself in order to make this uh, upcoming Battle of Fire a reasonable challenge for these forces within Marine. Going from one side of the world to the other, we now arrive at what is probably the most minor character on this list, but nonetheless, he's one of my favorites. Roderick Harlaw, also called Roderick the Reader, is a member of House Harlaw on the Iron Islands. These lands are typically known for focusing solely on raiding and pillaging and the sea, and Roderick does not fit into these kind of ideals of an ironborn whatsoever. He's very studied and scholarly. He's even ordering a pair of glasses from the Greenlands. He's one of the few lords who supports Asha's claim to the Seastone Chair, and he does seem very wise for doing so, as out of all of the candidates, she is pretty by far the best. She is not uh, so old that she can't stand, she is not a psychopathic uh, pirate, and she is not uh, also a psychopathic pirate. In addition to this, he ends up being one of the few people to see through Euron's kind of deceptions, as he seems to have a bit of doubt that Euron has seen Valyria and spelled the smoking sea. He's also got one of my favorite quotes in the series, just as a history teacher, that being, I prefer my history dead. Dead history is writ in ink, the living sort in blood. Additionally, he might have some large role in the series in the future. He is the only person to see through Euron's plan with the Shield Isles. So in the books, Euron captures this series of islands off the Reach and immediately gives them to a bunch of people who almost supported him but were kind of on the fence about it to shore up their loyalty and then essentially to have them lose them eventually when the reach comes because they are very much an unwinnable position they cannot be held by the ironborn he knows this and he knows that he is giving this to his enemies to kind of be a defeat so he won't be defeated and roderick is one of the only people to see through this additionally in terms of his role in the future he is the person who informs asha to kind of look at the histories and get into the idea of this late comer to the king's moot being a way to nullify it which is something i talked about in my Captain Kingmaker video, which you can see in the cards. Overall, Roderick the Reader is a fascinating character and an interesting divergence from what is typically thought of as an Ironborn. I imagine if he were in the show, he would not be wearing the same coat that all of the Ironborn are wearing. Northern politics in the show are essentially the Boltons and the Starks and nobody else. Good versus evil, no room in between. However, in the books, there are a number of different dimensions to this conflict that are entirely lost, as well as several fantastic characters. One of those is Lady Barbary Dustin, who is something of an anomaly in the North. She was initially in love with Brandon Stark, not Bran Stark, the kid in the wheelchair beyond the wall, but Ned Stark's older brother, Brandon Stark. The two of them had an affair, but later Brandon Stark was engaged to Catelyn Tully. He then went south to uh, essentially find Lyanna after she was taken by Rhaegar and ends up getting burned alive by the Mad King. Because of this and a number of choices made between the main series and Robert's Rebellion, she really isn't a big fan of Ned Stark, which is pretty much a very much a strange circumstance or perspective for any northern lord or lady. Additionally, she is fairly uh, big with the Boltons. She very much supports them, but she really doesn't like Ramsay, which is an interesting dynamic given the fact that Roos is in control of things at Winterfell now, but it seems as though that might not always be the case. Specifically, Domeric Bolton, Ramsay's first trueborn son, was a cupbearer at her castle for a long time, for about four years when he was growing up. She knows that Ramsay likely killed Domeric, and because of this, she very much does not like the Balton bastard. 
We mostly get to know Barbary through Theon's perspective in A Dance with Dragons, where she questions him on the past, the present, Winterfell, Ramsay, and his current circumstances. Specifically, the two of them take a trip down into Winterfell's crypts, where she discovers the fact that four swords seem to be missing. These were the swords taken by Bran's party on their escape from Winterfell, and could be used as corroborating evidence for Rickon's survival, based on Wex's information passed on along to Lord Wyman Manderly, who's another character who's very different in the books. This leads people to believe that Barbary Dustin might be involved in certain schemes in Winterfell. Particularly, she might be involved in some form of Stark restoration. It's worth noting that Brandon Stark was often described as a wild wolf in stories, specifically by a uh, Jojen uh, Reed, and Rickon, who is the person that they're trying to restore, does match this description fairly well. He's a wild Stark, so maybe in this uh, kind of deal between her and Wyman Manderly, that element was something that she very much would have liked. Additionally, both of these characters are seen as snowmen in the yard of Winterfell, and fans believe that this is an indication of some conspiracy, as there are other snowmen who do seem to be involved in other uh, kind of nefarious dealings in Winterfell. The final two characters I'm going to discuss today both have ties to the Wall, one in the present and one in the past. The first of these, I would say, is one of the most famous characters to appear in only the books, that being Patchface. Patchface is the fool of Stannis Baratheon. He serves his court and is best friends with his daughter, one Shireen Baratheon. Patchface is a bit of a strange character. He was initially said to be very bright and intelligent, but he was in a shipwreck on his way back from Essos. He was the only survivor of this incident, and surviving it seems to have left him changed. He's no longer the bright boy that was promised in letters by Stannis's father, but rather he seems to have these fits and these kind of visions almost. He sings these cryptic songs throughout the book, some of which seem to come true. He's one of the few characters to predict the Red Wedding before it happens, along with the ghost of High Heart and Daenerys. And he has a number of prophecies throughout A Storm of Swords and A Dance with Dragons that do seem like they might have some bearing on the winds of winter. Specifically, even Melisandre is scared of him, as he is a mystical presence at the Wall, and she sees him in visions in her flames with skulls about him and blood on his teeth. He's one of the characters I dislike the omission of the most. I think that they were kind of scared of the magical elements of the story, and I think that Patchface is very much kind of a walking, talking magical element, in addition to being a bit more silly and colorful, at least on the surface, and they really kind of wanted to be the dark, gritty fantasy. I like some of the elements of the book that are a bit brighter and have a bit more, kind of at least a surface level of just kind of happy fool, but a deeper, kind of more ominous level of prophecy. He's essentially this uh, indicator of the magic that could exist here, but he was removed entirely. Entirely. Additionally, David and Dan really do not seem to like Stannis' camp, uh, so I would assume that they just tried to remove as much as they could from that. The final character on this list is also probably my favorite on this list, and he's one that I really hadn't picked up on much until my recent reread of A Storm of Swords. Donald Noy is a character who does not appear at all in the television show, but he's a massive influence on Jon Snow in the books. He's a one-armed blacksmith of the Night's Watch, and he has a very interesting history. He was initially the castle blacksmith of Storm's End, serving House Baratheon for many, many years. However, he did lose his arm in the Siege of Storm's End, which does seem kind of odd to me, given that there was really little action in that siege, though I could see it being kind of a Snowpiercer situation in terms of losing an arm. That aside, after this incident, he kind of exiles himself to the Wall, where he serves out his days. He kind of guides John a little bit in the first book. In the second book, he remains at the Wall with the few people who stay back during the Great Ranging. And in the third book, he sort of assumes command, where there really isn't any in John's and Jaor's absence. It is in this leadership role where Donald Noy really comes into his own and begins to shine. He serves as an excellent leader of the Night's Watch, balancing all of their needs and putting together a stellar defense of the Wall against both the Thens attacking from the south and Mance Raider attacking from the north. He serves as a guiding force for Jon during this time, and overall it just serves as the best leader that the Wall could pretty much ask for. In the books, he is the one who ends up going into the tunnel and dying in combat against Magmar Tundowe. As in single combat, this one-armed blacksmith, along with several of his brothers, is able to take down one of the last giants in the world as a final act of strength and perseverance by this excellent character. We see Jon Snow follow in Donald's footsteps as a leader throughout A Dance with Dragons. His thoughts often turn to his old mentor and what he might have done, and additionally, Jon Snow literally follows in Donald Noy's footsteps, taking up residence in the blacksmith's old chambers, after he gives the King's Tower, the old Lord Commander chambers, to King Stannis Baratheon during his residence at the Wall. It's also good to note that Donald, like Roderick, has another one of my favorite quotes in the series, that being his description of the Baratheon brothers. Quote, 
Robert was the true steel. Stannis is pure iron, black and hard and strong, yes, but brittle the way iron gets. He'll break before he bends. And Renly, that one, he's copper, bright and shiny, pretty to look at, but not worth all that much at the end of the day. It's a really interesting quote. I like that description of the Baratheon brothers as these metals, though it does seem a little harsh to me, given that he left Storm's End when Renly was like three or four to pass that kind of judgment on a three or four year old. But overall, you do you, Donald Noy. All of these characters were fantastic additions to the series that add dimensions to the story that are otherwise lost in Game of Thrones. I think they would have been great additions to the show while it was airing, and overall I do hope that if there is ever some other adaptation down the line, at least some of these characters would be included in the story. Thank you all for watching. This has been a ton of fun to make. If you want to see more, be sure to leave a comment. Let me know who I missed, who you'd want to see in the future. I'd love to cover more characters or characters that have changed or other stuff. I love talking about anything Song of Ice and Fire, and I hope that you have enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to leave a like and subscribe, all that typical YouTube stuff. Uh, I hope you're proud of me for not talking about John Connington today. I almost did, but I didn't, and I'm very proud of myself for not doing so. I'll be back with more videos in the near future, and I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. Thank you again, and I will see you soon.